This morning, by God's grace, I want us to consider together God's word from the subject, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Well over three decades, we've seen Abraham walking with the Lord and trusting in God's promises. Today's passage reveals the culmination of Abraham's walk with the Lord. By far the most monumental challenge of his entire life. Without telling him exactly why or even exactly where, the Lord suddenly calls to Abraham gives him a command that must have rocked him to his core. Tells him to offer up his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loved. This, son, this command perhaps seemed unthinkable to Abraham because it appeared to be completely contradictory to the promises that the Lord had offered Abraham. Remember, God had promised Abraham that in in Isaac shall your offspring be named. You see, everything for Abraham was was, was tied, was bound up with the well-being of Isaac. And suddenly God calls to Abraham out of nowhere seemingly and tells him, now I want you to give me Isaac. I want you to give me the very thing that you had pinned all your hopes upon. I want you to give me the very thing that had had, had brought you so much joy, the very thing that you had been waiting decades for. The Lord offers the command in a way that heightens the tension reveals exactly how difficult this would have been for Abraham. I want you to notice the way in which he says that he he calls to Abraham. I want you to give me your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Remember, this was Abraham's son whom he deeply loved. You you, you remember how much Abraham had loved Ishmael, his firstborn? He loved Ishmael so much, he didn't didn't want to to, to let Ishmael go. Uh, Over the time, over the years, God had had, had knitted Abraham's heart to Ishmael, and and he had loved Ishmael so much it was hard for him to let go. And, and and, and, And over the series of time since Ishmael had had gone and been put away, now Abraham's heart had had grown to be knit to Isaac. This was his son. This was Isaac, whose name meant laughter. And after decades of waiting, when the Lord finally brought the son of promise, he brought laughter and joy in his parents' hearts. They loved him deeply and, 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 and and, 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 and God says, not only that, th- this is your only son. After Ishmael had been put away and had been disinherited and could, could not be a co-heir with Abraham, all of Abraham's hopes, all of the covenant community's hopes, all of the world's hopes were pinned, were tied, were bound up with Isaac. And and God says to Abraham, now I want you to take that very same Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. And I want to ask you, how could Abraham return from sacrificing Isaac and ever look Sarah in the face again? How could Abraham return from sacrificing 
Isaac and, and ever look the covenant community in the face again? How could Abraham return from sacrificing Isaac and ever look even at their pagan neighbors who knew what their hope was in, ever look them in the face again? This was a monumental challenge. This was a monumental test. The scripture tells us that, that, that God, it starts out by saying that God tested Abraham. And the good news about the fact that this was a test and that it was coming from God is that God never tests us to break us down. God always tests us to build us up. Every test from the Lord is really meant to strengthen us, is really meant as a blessing, and, and is really meant to build us up. But you see, the very nature of a test is to strengthen us through tension. It's, it's, it's to strengthen us to, through tension. The very nature of a test is to put us outside of our comfort zone, to put us in a place of pressure, to put us in a place in, uh, that, our, that our faith has perhaps never gone before. And the question is asked, will you trust me now? now we've, we've, we've seen God take a lot of things from Abraham. When he first came into the land, the Lord removed the rain from the land, and there was a drought. And God was saying to Abraham, now that I've removed this rain, will you trust me now? And, 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 and then when he went down into the land of Egypt and, and suddenly his wife was, was, was snatched from him through, through, through his own dealings, God was, was asking Abraham, now that your wife has been taken away, will you still trust me? And then and, and, and Abraham went, went, went back into the land and, 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 and through a series of events, uh, Ishmael came and, and then, then, then God called Ishmael away and, 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 and God was saying, now that your firstborn has been gone, will you still trust me? And then this, this last week we saw the way in which the people came down and they snatched the well away from Abraham. And said, well, even without water in the land, will you trust me? And in and, and, and each place, the Lord is, is heightening the tension, is, 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 is building up to this place. And so now finally, uh, Abraham has gotten to the place where God calls for the greatest sacrifice of all. Give me your son, your only son whom you love, the son of promise, Isaac. Give him to me. Remove him from your presence. And will you trust me now? The Lord has a way, not only giving us our best, but sometimes requiring our best in order to prove that we are not trusting in the thing he gave us, but indeed we are trusting in God himself to help us to prove, to show that Christ and our God is sufficient all by himself. And what we're going to see here is that, is, is that God, through this entire situation, we, we, we know because the name of this place is the Lord will provide, is going to be providing for Abraham. And first we're going to see this. The first thing we're going to see God provide is a saving faith. A saving faith. Now, now, God has already given Abraham a saving faith. When, when Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, but, but here what we're going to see is that God is going to provide for that saving faith. He's going to mature that saving faith to show it to be an obedient faith, an authentic faith, a faith that truly trusts God rather than to lean on its own understanding. And so the Lord offers this call to Abraham. And I want you to notice the way the call is structured. The Lord says to Abraham, go forth to the land of Moriah, to the mountain that I will show you. Now, that ought to sound familiar to some of us. For those of us who have walked down through Genesis and, and we remember God's initial call to Abraham. We remember what God said 
to Abraham when he called him out of Ur the Chaldee. He said, I want you to go to the land that I will show you. The particular Hebrew construction is lech lecha, translated go forth in both of these passages, Genesis 22 and Genesis 12, is the only time in which this construction is used in the entire Bible. And so when God offers the call in this way, he is directly alluding to in Abraham's mind and in the original audience's mind to the very first time in which he called Abraham. And not just when he first called Abraham, but, but God is calling Abraham to reflect and recall and think about the past 30 years of God's faithfulness to Abraham. See, God never, God, God never gives you pressure without giving you provision. God never sends you into a test without first recalling to mind his promises. And, and, and what, what God is saying, even before, even as he, even as he structures the call to Abraham, I want you to notice that, that, that God, first thing God said before he even structured the call is when he called Abraham by name. He said, Abraham. Oh, that, well, what does that mean? Well, remember, this was the name that God gave this man. His name used to be Abram, but, but, but when God promised to make him the father of a multitude, he gave him a promissory name. He gave him the name Abraham, which means father of a multitude. And so God, in calling Abraham by that name, is saying, I'm still committed to make you the father of a multitude. Even before I call you to give up your son, you must know that I'm still committed to fulfill my promise. So God, God is committed and God makes Abraham, calls Abraham to, 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 to recall God's faithfulness to him over the past 30 years. The way in which he brought Abraham through trial after trial, the way in which he, he showed himself faithful to Abraham and Sarah, and most of all, in bringing the son of promise through Abram's lifeless loins and Sarah's dead womb, the Lord did the impossible. By, 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 by recalling, by, you know, Abraham knew who his only son is. Uh, but, but, but God said, I want you to give me your son, your only son, Isaac. Abraham knew who he was talking about, but God said, remember, his name is Isaac. Remember, I gave him that name because, remember, you laughed at my promise. And Sarah laughed at my promise, but, 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 but I was able to do the impossible when you laughed at my promise. I gave you joy in the midst of sorrow. I was able to bring life from the dead. And so remember these things, Abraham. And so God is, is loading Abraham up with all of these promises. And, 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 and Abraham had three whole days to ruminate and think and deliberate over God's promises. As he walked on this journey and as he thought about what he had to do and how he had to do it, he must have continued to cling to these promises and, 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 God's, and the record of God's faithfulness and, and the way in which God uh, uh, was good to him and brought life from the dead and brought laughter from sorrow. And so when he finally arrives to the site, after three days, Abraham turns to his two servants that, that went with him, these two members of the community of faith that went with him, and he says this to them. He says, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. And we, first person plural, will come again to you. You might not have caught that. Abraham gets to the place in which he's about to go and offer up this sacrifice. And he says to these men, now, now, we are going over there and we are coming back. Now, 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 remember, God has called Abraham to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering to put his son to death. But, but, but because of God's promises and, and by grace, God has worked the faith in Abraham that could believe that God could bring life even from the dead. 
And, 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 and it was through this trial that the Lord proved the authenticity of Abraham's faith and caused him to have a faith, in, in the, a resurrection faith that, that went beyond anything he could have ever imagined or thought. But can't you see God taking a man who was weak and feeble, a man who, who, who left the land of promise and fled down into Egypt, a man who lied to Pharaoh and lied to Abimelech about his wife, a, a man who, 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 who tried to devise a, another scheme to, to take Hagar to try to fulfill the promise in his own strength, a man who didn't even want to let Ishmael go, who, who had to be made to let Ishmael go to, in order to, to trust in the promise. Here's a man who struggled with his faith, but but, but God was able to work in the life of a struggler to give him the kind of faith that would believe that God could bring life from the dead. You see, it, it's to the glory of God that Abraham was able to go through with this. And, and as Hebrews, as the book of Hebrews picks up on this statement, it asserts that by faith, Abraham considered that God was even able to raise Isaac from the dead. How? How did, did Abraham go through with this? It, it wasn't that he mustered up his faith. It, it was that God had shown himself so faithful. God had, already, God had already, in a sense, brought Isaac from a dead womb. And, and if God would bring Isaac from a dead womb, if he would do all of these things on behalf of the promise, then surely God will raise Isaac from the dead. So Abraham trusts and depends on the promises of God, even in a situation that went beyond the pale of his personal understanding. God puts Abraham in a tense situation and does not, in, the, in, that, in that particular instance, resolve the tension. He just says, I want you to give him to me. I want you to go beyond your own understanding. And, 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 and he makes Abraham the, the poster child for Proverbs 3 and 5, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Listen, beloved, faith is developed beyond the pale of personal understanding. If you only trust, listen to me, if you only trust God, when you understand exactly what he's up to, then you are not really trusting God. If, if you only trust God when you can trace out his hand and you know exactly what he's doing, then you're not really trusting God. You're really trusting yourself. You're really leaning on your own wisdom. You're, you're, you're really wise in your own eyes. But, 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 but God will put you in a situation when you don't know your right hand from your left. God will take some things from you that will confuse you and perplex you in order to say, will you trust me now? Will, will, will you trust me when you don't know where it's coming from? Will you trust me when you don't know how it'll work out? Will you trust me now? Will you, will you trust me when all you have is my promises? Will you trust me now? Will you trust me now? And, 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 and God has put Abraham in a situation when all he has to depend on is the faithfulness and the promises of God. He put, situ he put Abraham in a situation where he has no other lifelines, where he has had to bet his last dollar on the Lord. God will put you in situations in which he takes away every last lifeline that you thought you had. Listen, listen, and you've got to understand when God does it, it's not that God is mistreating you. It's not that God is neglecting you. It's not that God is doing anything wrong to you. But it means when God puts you in a difficult situation and when God puts you in a hardship and when God takes away the Isaacs of your life, what God is doing is he's treating you as a son or daughter. What God is doing is he's mature touring your faith. What God is doing is he's showing himself to be Jehovah Jireh, your provider. And so as you are in hardships, don't complain against the Lord. Say, thank you, Lord. Even in my hurt, you're Jehovah Jireh. Even when I don't understand it, you're Jehovah Jireh. Even when I've got to cry sometimes, you're Jehovah Jireh. Even when I don't have a pity to my name, you're still Jehovah Jireh. God loves us 
so much that he doesn't just give us what we want. God gives us what we need. And isn't it true? Isn't it true that oftentimes the love we need the most is the love we want the least? Mm. Oh, isn't that true? We have things in our life. And, 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 we, and when we know in our hearts, we say, Lord, I'll give you anything but that. I'll give you my time. I'll give you my money. I'll give you this, that, and the other. But don't you dare call for my children. Don't you call for my spouse. Don't you call for my health. Don't you call for the things that I really, really, really think I need and I really, really think I'm entitled to. You know, we, 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 it's not that God will just take away sin, but God will take away things that you think you're entitled to. I mean, Abraham thought he was entitled to Isaac. God had promised him Isaac, and, and, and Abraham had waited a long time, and, and Abraham had, had, had prayed a whole lot, and, and Abraham had believed the Lord, and Isaac finally came, and you mean to tell me that you're going to ask for Isaac? Couldn't you take my, something out of my tent? Couldn't you take anything else? Couldn't you? I got a whole lot of money. Can you take this money? Can you take these servants? Anything but Isaac. No. God will call for your Isaacs. God will call for your Isaacs. And, and, and when he does, and when he does, when he does, you have to recognize and confess that indeed, even in taking away our Isaacs, God is providing for us. He's providing for our faith. He is, he, listen, listen, he is showing himself to be Jehovah Jireh. It's amazing that, 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 that this, this is a revelation of who God is. God, God called the name of the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah, the covenant name of God, the, the, the great covenant name of God, Jehovah Jireh. It, what this means is that it, it's a part of who he is to provide for his people. G g g uh, for God to be God, he must provide. For listen, listen, that is, it flows out from his character. It, it flows out from his nature. Uh, it, it, it's who he is. And so... God be God in your situation. He must be providing for you. He is Jehovah Jireh. And so we see not only that the Lord is providing a saving faith, the Lord is also providing here a saving sacrifice. He's providing a saving sacrifice. Verse 7 and 8, on the way up the mountain, Isaac, the son of promise, notices that there is no sacrificial animal. And, 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 and he, he, he asks his father, he calls out to his father in this touching, uh, uh, moving uh, a scene. He, he, he asks him, he says, look, I, 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 see, I, see this, I see this wood and, 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 and I, see, I see this knife. I see all the things that are necessary for a sacrifice, but, but, but where is the lamb? And, God, and Abraham responds and says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. After the Lord provides the sacrificial animal at the moment of truth, Abraham goes on to call the name of the place, as we said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And, and, and Abraham goes on to pass down the prophetic idiom, uh, a saying amongst the people of God, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now this is a really interesting thing because in the Hebrew, the word provide is actually the same word for to see to see. And that's interesting because there, 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 are, there are other Hebrew words that could be rendered to provide, but, the, but this particular text uses this particular word, the same word that means to see or, or to appear. And, and, and so this text has this kind of, this word has this kind of double meaning that the original audience would have clearly recognized. And, and, and so many translations, uh, particularly translations uh, within the Jewish community, actually use that form of, of, of the word. And, I, and I, I want you to think about how that, how that would have gone, how that would sound uh, if it were translated differently. On the mountain of the Lord, it shall appear. God's salvation. It shall appear. The, let, let's translate it what, from what Abraham said. Uh, 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 God, listen, listen, God will appear himself, the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Woo-hoo! 
Woo! God will be seen to be the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And across the generations, the Old Testament people of God held on to this truth that, that no matter what happens in our lives, one day the mount, on the mountain of God's choosing, the sacrificial lamb that will bring salvation will appear. And so this entire episode points forward to and foreshadows the saving sacrifice that of, uh, uh, listen, of God's own son who would come and take away the sins of of the world. When John the Baptist came as the forerunner and he finally saw the lamb, he looked at his disciples who knew the scriptures, who knew uh, the story of Abraham, who knew the story of the binding of Isaac, who understood what Abraham said when he said that one day that this salvation shall appear. And, 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 and John knew exactly what he was saying. And he saw Jesus Christ and he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All that Abraham is doing here is foreshadowing that great sacrifice in which the Lamb of God would make, in which God the Father would make to purchase our salvation. And I, and I want you to, and I want to, I want to talk about this quickly from two different vantage points. I want you to consider first the sacrifice that the Father makes of His Son. Listen to the call of verse two. Remember what it says. It said, "Take your son, your only son." Whom you love. This passage reveals something incomprehensible to us. It reveals something of the incomprehensible cost that our Heavenly Father paid for your salvation and for my salvation. And it reveals the incomprehensible love that God the Father has for his children. We oftentimes talk about the love of the Son, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but I want us to focus our attention right now where the text points us the love of the Father for his children, the love of the Father for his people. And I want you to think about it as we think about Abraham's great love for his son Isaac. It was only a pale, faint shadow of the eternal love that God the Father has for God the Son. Colossians 1.13, Ephesians 1, 1.6 calls Jesus Christ the beloved Son. He, he's God's unique and only Son, God of very God, who has been with the Father from an eternity past, ages upon ages. Before there was, there was God the Father and God the Son and, and God the Holy Spirit and an eternal uh, uh, bond of love. An eternal bond of joy. You, you, think, you think that Isaac was the joy of Abraham? The, the son is the eternal joy of the father. Jesus Christ describes himself as not just a son of God, but the son of God. And not just, and, and notice the scriptures, notice how, how God says, the, the, it makes the call, he says, take your son, your only son. Your only son. And so when Jesus Christ comes and he talks about who he is to the Father, he doesn't just talk about himself as a son, but God's only son. And, he's, and he talks about himself as, as God's only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave to us his only begotten son. The, the greatest gift that could be, ever be given. And, and, and I want you to think about that. Abraham had uh, three days to think about making this sacrifice. But, but the father had an eternity to think about making the sacrifice. The, 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 the father had 42 generations to think about making the sacrifice. And, and the father Father gave to us not his second best, but his very best, the very best thing that he could, could, could possibly give, the greatest gift of all the world given for your salvation and my salvation. This greatest gift was brought down and wrapped through 40 and two generations carefully wrapped and and so the father gave him over and gave him over a, a, a gift beyond our wildest comprehension. But the hardest part was not carefully wrapping the gift, as it were, but it was placing it upon the tree. Because uh, when we see this, listen, when we see the son saying to the father in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. And when we see, when we see the, 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 the son calling out to the father, father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What we see is we see a God doing what Abraham foreshadowed 
Job willing to do what it takes to lay down the wood on his son's back, willing to lead him up the mountain, willing uh, with nails to providentially bind his son to the altar, willing to turn his face away to make the ultimate sacrifice that would bring many sons to glory. And I want to ask you, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son, listen, to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. God's love is powerful. God's love is ineffable. God's love is incomprehensible. God's love is vast beyond all measure. What you think? God the Father didn't stand back at a distance when this thing went down. When you see Abraham leading his son up the mountain and taking the knife and, and, and listen, this shows us how personal this was for God the Father. That through his providential hand, he himself was orchestrating these events, listen, listen, upon the mountain of the Lord to bring, to make the substitutionary sacrifice that was necessary for you and for me to be with the Lord forever. Upon the mountain of the Lord, God's salvation was seen. It was provided Upon Calvary, it was, it was provided for God's people. And as we consider the depth of this love, listen, as we consider the depth of this love, it ought to cause us to rejoice, listen, in the certainty and the glory of our salvation. Paul takes this up in Romans 8, 32, and he asks the questions. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge? against God elect it is God who justifies listen who is it to condemn if God would sacrifice beloved this much to purchase us will he not bring us to himself if God would place such a wondrous gift upon the tree will he not see to it that you and I will enjoy all the wonderful benefits of that gift if God would pay this much to purchase your seat and my seat at the table won't he make sure that you and I will get to the table oh beloved oh beloved can't you see the boundless depths of the love the commitment of the love how the, the steadfastness of the love of God our father for his children God's love is so great and so boundless and so deep and so wide and I just want us to just rest our weary souls in the depths of that love. Yes, sir. Listen, get your, get your mind off yourself for a minute. Stop, 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 listen, listen, stop throwing a pity party for yourself for a minute. Stop, stop being stuck on yourself and stop. Listen, let, I'm talking to myself as well. Let, 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 let us stop navel gazing and let us just, just cast our eye upon the ocean of God's love for his people. If, if God never does another thing for you, he's already done enough. If God never gives you another thing, he's already given enough. God has given his son, and that's something that can never be taken away. Something that the world didn't give, something that the world can't take away. So I don't care what situation you find yourself in. You've got reason to rejoice. You've got reason to hope. You've got reason to say thank you. You've got reason to say, if I don't have another thing, thank you for the son. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for my place at the table, Lord. Thank you that you have committed to me, and you will never turn away. We've got 10,000s upon 10,000s reasons to give God praise and to give him thanks. Yes, yes. I just want you to think about all that God has done for you. Yes. And finally, the Lord provides a saving submission. The Lord provides a saving submission. Just notice this. It says in verse 6 that Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. 
Then later on in verse 9, it says, And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar and there laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And we've talked about Abraham's part in this, but I want you to notice Isaac's part in this. Isaac is described with the very same word that described Abraham's two servants that came along with him. Ab Isaac was not a little boy right here. Isaac, Isaac was a young man walking with his elderly father. Abraham over 100 years old at this point, and, and, and Isaac is a young man. He's virile and strong, and, 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 and he's, he's doubtless stronger than his elderly father at this point. I mean, if, at any point, Isaac could have just turned around and ran away. At any point, Isaac could say, wait a minute now. <laughs> What are you doing, Daddy? We, we, I'm through with this. <laughs> he could have jumped off and, and broke himself free and ran, ran down the mountain. But, 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 but listen, I want you to notice that, 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 that Isaac, in view of God's promises, knowing that God would do a great work through his life, submits to his father's leading. He, he listen, listen, he lets Abraham place the wood on his back, knowing that there was no sacrificial lamb. I just want you to think about that. He lets Abraham place the wood on his back. What, what, who does that sound like? Who does that sound like? Who, who, what, what son of promise uh, allowed the father to place the wood on his back? Woo -hoo. It, well, it, Jesus Christ, the son of promise, uh, 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 bowed beneath the father's will and allowed the father to place the cross, the wood, upon his back. And, 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 then, and then Isaac followed his son, followed his, Isaac followed his father up the mountain. Jesus Christ, with the wood on his back, follows the father's leading up the mountain, up Mount Calvary. Then he lets Abraham, Isaac lets Abraham bind him and lay him on the altar. And Jesus Christ submits himself and stretches out his hands and allows the Father with the nails to bind him to the altar. And then he sees his Father pick up the knife and, and Jesus Christ sees all of the wrath of God laid upon him as the Father lays the curse upon his back. The Father abandons him, turns his face away and, 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 and he, he, he knows, uh, but, but he knows, he does it in faith that God's promise must be fulfilled through him. That Abraham's offspring will be named through him. And so he trusts his father even unto death. And that, that's, that's just like Jesus Christ who, who demonstrated a greater faith and obedience than even Isaac demonstrated. Jesus Christ who throughout his life told them that, 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 that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hand of sinners. That, that, that he must be sped upon. That he must, be, that he must, be, that he must suffer but, and, and die. But on the third day that he would be raised again. And Hebrews 10, 5 talks about the committed faith of the Son. It says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Listen, listen, this, this supposed burnt offering of, of Isaac would not be the ultimate sacrifice. That, that all of the burnt offerings of the lambs and the animals that had been made up to that point, listen, would not do a thing to, to forgive our sins. They, would do, they couldn't take away one single sin. They couldn't remove one single ounce of guilt. But Jesus Christ, the greater Isaac, said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O oh God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book, Jesus Christ's sacrifice was the sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ's obedience was the obedience that would please God the Father. Jesus Christ's life was the life that would be offered up and would reveal the salvation that the Lord would provide his people. And he was willing to take the curse upon himself so that we might receive our inheritance. Westminster Confession of Faith Question 49 says, how did Christ humble himself 
in his death? How did Christ submit the way Isaac did in his death? How did Christ submit to be bound in his death? And it says, Christ humbled himself in his death in that having been betrayed by Judas, forsaken by his disciples, scorned and rejected by the world, condemned by Pilate, tormented by his persecutors, having also conflicted with the terrors of death and the powers of darkness, felt and borne the weight of God's wrath, and he laid down his life and offering for sin, enduring the painful, shameful, and cursed death of the cross. He paid it all so that you and I could receive our inheritance. And I don't know whether you're grateful this morning, but you ought to be grateful for the sacrifice of the Son. He, he, he did it all so, so that we could become the people of God. He did it all so that we could be blessed and so that an innumerable multitude of God's people from every tribe and nation and tongue could be counted amongst the people of God. He did it all so that you and I could possess the very gates of our enemies, the gates of hell, and so that evil and sin and death would not prevail against you and would not prevail against me. He paid it all. Ooh, listen, listen, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but through the, listen, through the submission of the Son, through the obedience of the Son, listen, listen, Jesus' blood has washed it white as snow. I thank the Lord for providing a saving, listen, a saving submission on this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that, that when you could have, when you, listen, when, when you could have called 10,000 legions of angels, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you could have unbound yourself from the cross and come down off the cross and condemned us to an everlasting torment of hell, you, he would, listen, listen, he could have been, he would have been right and just and good still if he had left us to our own devices, but his love and his submission and his compassion for you and for me kept him there kept him on the altar kept him laying it down because he knew that you needed a sacrifice he knew that I needed a sacrifice and I, oh, I, just, I just want you to think about that this morning it's, I, I, and I, I, I know I'm preaching the gospel this morning if I've never preached the gospel I know I'm preaching it this morning this is pure gospel this morning I asked you if you were ready for the gospel. This is pure gospel right here. I want you to think about the love of the Son for you. We talked about the love of the Father for you. I want you to think about the love of the Son for you. This is God's love for you. I just want you to receive that. Think about that. And God, listen, listen. God doesn't just give lip service. He gives life service. He said, listen, you want to know how much I love you? It's not just in what I say to you, but I want you to look at this demonstration of my love. And if you want to know how much I love you, I want you to see how much I laid down for you. If you want to know whether I'm committed to you, just listen, listen, watch what I do. Watch me submit myself beneath the wrath of God, beneath the curse of sin, so that you could be forgiven and I could be forgiven. God, the Father, God, the Son, has, has lavished an amazing, boundless love upon us today. We don't deserve the least a bit, the least amount of it, but God has done it for us anyway. For his own glory and for the good of his people. If you walk out of here knowing anything today, you ought to walk out of here knowing God loves me. God, lo listen, and God's love for me is better than anything the world has to offer. God. God's love for me is better than anything that I could offer myself. God's love for me. God has been better to me than I've ever been to myself. God has been better to me than, than my family or my friends or anyone in all this world has ever been to me. God's love for me. God's love for you. Can't you see that today? Can't you see that? And I, and I want you to listen, because the only way that you will live a better life is as you reflect on this love. If you, if you look at Abraham and you say, man, I just got to muster up my strength and just be like Abraham, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. You'll give up the first day. You say, well, I just can't give him my best. I just can't give him my brightest. I just can't give him the best thing in my life. I just can't do that. Because my sense of duty is not strong enough. But listen to this. 
God's love is able to swallow up your incapabilities and give you the faith and the grace to give him things that you thought you'd never give it. When you think about how good God has been to you, you end up saying, Lord, for you I live and for you I die. Lord, if you got to take everything I have, I'll give it all because of how much you've given to me. If you take everything I have, it will be a pale comparison of the ocean of grace that you've already given to me. And it's a privilege and it's an honor to give you everything I have, Lord. It's a privilege and an honor to give you everything I have, Lord. To point to the glories and the excellencies and the worth of the Lord Jesus Christ to show the world how good he is. To show the world that he's better to me than gold and silver. He's better to me than family. He's better to me than jobs. He's better to me than careers. He's better to me than money. He's better to me than everything. He's, he's worthy. His love is more precious. More precious than gold, more precious than silver. And listen, if, if, you, if you don't know him today, you, let me ask you, why not? Why not? If you don't, listen, if you haven't bowed before him and received the, the, the gift of salvation, if you haven't run to the cross, if you haven't thrown yourself at his mercies, why not? Why are you holding back? Why are you clinging to your idols? Why are you clinging to the things of this world that are fading away and destined for destruction anyway? Why are you clinging to temporary lifelines that don't actually, that, that don't actually, won't actually give you life? Why, why, why are you clinging to, to, to cracked cisterns that can't even hold water? Well, well, why are you clinging to the things that, 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 listen, listen, every idol you have always breaks its promises. It can never satisfy. It can, it, can never, it can never finally bring you life. This is the only way of life. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? You'd have to be a lunatic not to serve a God like this. You, you'd have to be crazy not to serve a God like this, a God that would do this for his people. God, God, the world can never be as good to you as God. And so I just want to implore you, I just want to beg you, this Christmas... This Christmas, I will receive the greatest gift that has ever been given. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins. Turn from, from trusting in your own ways. Turn from being wise in your own eyes. And throw yourself upon the mercies of Jesus Christ. And you will, and you will find that he will never, ever, ever disappoint that he will always, listen, that he will receive you and he will give you mercy and grace and compassion beyond your wildest dreams, that he will be the gift that keeps on giving. Amen.